Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today as we talk all about uh, ELISA sound system specifically and how we do uh, algorithms in ELISA for funnel sound systems. I want to thank you guys for joining us. My name is Scott Sugden. I'm Product and Technology Outreach Manager here at L Acoustics, and I have a panel of real experts on the topic of all things multi-channel and immersive hyper-real sound systems. Coming to us uh, from Greater London, uh, Guillaume, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. How are things? Uh, you're on the uh, south half of London, is that correct? Yes, I'm in uh, sunny side actually. I'm not sure about the north, but the sun uh, the sun is is here today in the South London. So hello everyone. Really happy to be here and uh, answer the all the topics related to algorithms. Excellent. And Guillaume, you've been a part of Team Eliza since uh, day uh, minus one. I think you joined uh, uh, before Eliza was even Eliza. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the project started a f uh, yeah, a few years ago now with um, Sharif Al Barbari that I'm sure many of uh, you know already and uh, Christian Hell, the founder of Hell Acoustics and myself and uh, it soon became a, a much bigger team and now uh, it's a full uh, dedicated team that uh, works on the algorithms and the software uh, all based in London. Excellent. Well, Guillaume, I'm really excited about today's conversation. I know it's a uh, a topic a lot of people know some things about whether uh, one format of an algorithm is better or another and so uh, we brought along uh, Etienne Cortel otherwise known as Mr. Science. Um, Etienne, um, it's great to see you. You've written uh, I believe 1150 AES papers, is that correct? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> And about that's 80 percent on spatial audio. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you've, you've you've done spatial audio your entire career, pretty much. Is that is that true? Since uh, uh, since school? Yeah, quite. A bit. Yeah, yeah. Since 2000. So a few years. years. It few hurts. Years, yeah. It hurts. Good. <laughs> Good. So um, Etienne has uh, Etienne has actually helped uh, write a paper that was uh, put on our website today. I will share the link with you uh, if you are live with us in Teams, and if you are watching on YouTube, the link is below in the notes. Um, so please uh, don't hesitate to download that paper. That helps uh, cover what we're talking about today. Um, and like uh, things that have been aged for 20 years, uh, Frederick Roskam, uh, one of the uh, key developers on Eliza. Thank you for joining us, uh, Frederick. How is uh, how is uh, everything with you? Yeah, hello Scott, uh, very well. Apparently it's sunny in North London as well. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've, I've joined the Eliza team at day one, not day minus one like Guillaume, so really at the very beginning of, uh, <laughs> of the adventure. Um, working on mostly on the algorithmic side, on the DSP side, so I'll be very happy to, to go through some of the details, some of the choices that we've made from the, from the beginning. Good. And and the most important question of the day is, uh, do algorithms get better with age or is that only wine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, I think there's always a value with age. Also with looking back how we, uh, you know, how we made, uh, made choices. So it's good. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you. So our, our presenters today, Guillaume, uh, Etienne and Frederick, we have a couple of moderators as well. If you're live with us, uh, they're going to help answer questions. Uh, also in London, Sergey, it's great to see you. Um, Sergey, you're going to help answer questions in uh, English, Russian, and are there any other languages or, or is that it for today? Uh, those two will do and most of them will be in English, I suppose. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, well, uh, really pleased to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, maybe I will learn something also uh, along the way of uh, answering questions. Uh, enjoy the webinar. Excellent. And uh, coming to us uh, from just, just outside of Paris, uh, Frederick Bongar, it's great to see you as well. Frederick, I like the the jacket today. Is it uh, is it a chilly day? Nice, is isn't it nice? I thought I had to be smart and then look good, so I've got the tan, I've got the jacket, I've got the shirt, everything right on. Uh, I'm a bit further than the the Paris neighborhood. I'm near the Belgian border, which unfortunately ah. is still closed, as is the uh, Swiss border. So a big hello to all our French speaking territories. Might it be Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, even Africa or wherever you are, Quebec, hello. So I'll be very enchanté de répondre à vos questions en français and some in English if you need any. Okay, uh, thank you for having me, Scott. Thank you, sir. Uh, and last and uh, most definitely not least, uh, Martin, uh, you are, I believe, in uh, Berlin, correct? 
Right, still in Berlin. It's uh, nice here. Everything is fine. I'm very excited to be in this uh, webinar and um, I can answer your questions in English or in German, wherever that is on the world. I don't know. I, th I don't think we have as many regions uh, like uh, Frederik has, but yeah, if you have a question in German, just ask it. Excellent. Well, uh, I'm going to kick it over to you, uh, Etienne. I think uh, you've got the first uh, first slide here. So, uh, Etienne, uh, please uh, take us on our way. Uh, actually, it's more Guillaume starting. Oh, that's Guillaume, okay. I, I read no worries. Wrong. Guillaume, have at it. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I will I will give a brief introduction about the Elisa concept, and then uh, we'll try to share the presentation time between. Uh, myself, Frédéric and Etienne to make sure it, it keeps you interested, you know. So let me start with the, the a nice picture here from the last Bon Iver tour in the US where you see a, a nice frontal system. And what we're going to talk about here today is really related to this kind of configuration, the case of frontal system. So what we call the frontal system is a combination of the speakers above the stage and I could extend to uh, the side of the stage. We'll see a, a bit later on with some diagrams. So maybe I would um, zoom out a bit of the topic and, and give a brief introduction about Elisa. Um, this is a typical picture of uh, a large scale stereo implementation. That's a picture from Coachella Festival a few years back. And we could say that's one of the biggest configuration you could deploy in stereo. You have huge K1 stacks on each side of the stage and uh, the best uh, signal chain you can get in stereo from world class uh, microphones to preamps to mixing desks to amplifiers to PA systems, right? So. What can we go? What can you know? How how can we improve that? Where can we go from from this situation? So that's a question we always wanted to to ask. You know, so um, I, I consider uh, we we can really uh, look at the the whole chain from the channel strip where we have uh, uh, some EQs, uh, all the channel processing, and a pan pot, which in most cases in in such large scale situation um, are. Uh, uh, not really widely used because um, you have to consider that the the coverage of each side of the um, the stage is is not really uh, covering the entire audience. So you somehow have to mix in mono. So you're mixing to a stereo bus, but usually with very little use of pan. So and yeah, what can you do there to to improve the the spatial impression? So what we see here is that actually. The control of space and the, the deployment of the system are hard coded somehow in a in a stereo bus. So, as a listener, what do you get? So you see a band on stage with different locations on stage, and what you hear is actually coming from a single direction, usually the direction from the speaker, which is closest to you due to the precedence effect. So for the brain, it's quite difficult to, to separate the sound objects, to, to give them a, a position in space for each other, or to know whether it's the lead guitar or the rhythmic guitar who is playing this particular part at a, at a point in time. So we give, a, we actually, we give, a, we bring complexity for the, for the listener to enjoy the show because he has in a way to, uh, process the, the conflicting cues between vision and audio. That's that's what you see on the right side here on the slide. So that usually leads to some kind of confusion or fatigue, and uh, you know we wanted to think about that and and provide solutions that could really improve this kind of uh, of issues. So two main points. It's basically uh, deploying multiple full range sources, which is a multi dimensional deployment, and using the concept of sound objects. So I will explain the two um, uh, a bit more in details in the next slides. So th there are really two, uh, two key aspects. On the left side, what you see is a typical left right um, dual mono deployment. So, in a way, um, if we take into account the same kind of power and energy that we can distribute to the, the same audience, there is uh, another way to distribute the sound energy is using a bigger number of smaller arrays. And that's what we call the frontal system here on the right side. And uh, 
it's uh, linked to the perception of hyperreal sound, which is really linked to the uh, a few different uh, perceptive aspects. So, what are the benefits? One of the first benefits is when using more sources, more speaker arrays, we inherently get a better separation of the sound objects in space. So it means that from um, a given position in the audience, we can picture in a much clearer way where the lead singer is, where the drummer is. And uh, if, if the audio mix is respecting the visual cues, it means that we can provide a much more natural experience for the listener as you know as um, as accurate as possible so it means that uh, we can get to a point where what you hear is what you see so it's really um, when it's well done you can almost achieve the, the situation where you completely forget there is a PA system in place and uh, obviously uh, that that's much less fatiguing for the brain so if we come back to the um, the, um, the first diagram of the channel strip and the pan pot, how to mix with such a system. So we have a much more uh, complex configuration of, of speakers. So what's the consequence on the on the mixing desk? It's actually quite simple to understand. We 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 just replace the notion of pan pot by um, description of the location of the um, the sound. So that's what we called. Um, positioning data, right? So that's, um, it can be pan, it can be distance, it can be width, so, such parameters. And what we call an audio object is actually the combination of the sound itself, so the channel strip, and the positioning metadata. So it's a sound and a description of its location. And actually, this is a concept which is not uh, very new. It has been uh, used in, in many different sectors like cinema, gaming, uh, broadcast and streaming. And uh, we see now that live sound is uh, is getting a, a big momentum on, on the topic as well with uh, Eliza and uh, other competitors technologies. So um, just to um, to give a rough overview uh, of the of the processor, I will uh, I will leave the, um, my colleague Fred to explain a bit the the inside of the Elisa processor. Actually, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I won't go into the details of you know the inputs outputs. This is something that was covered uh, already uh, in the previous webinars. But really focus into the DSP side where we have this multi-core floating point processing do, uh, unit doing all the all the heavy lifting for this special processing. Um, and for which we will focus on two bits in particular, where we have on, on one side the, um, the top top bit in the middle, you see, this special processing for the direct sound, which is basically placing the, the objects that, that Guillaume has mentioned, placing them in space in real time, whether it's in 2D, in 3D, um, and as well as feeding the mix downs that, that can be used for a number of uh, applications. So this, this ends up in what we call the ELISA speaker fees, the, the speaker outputs. And this is combined in parallel with the room engine, which will deal with, which basically will provide the canvas for objects to sit on with a lot, lot of control that we, we will detail a bit more for the, for, for the, for the reverb, yeah, basically how it will sound like, how it will, uh, it will evolve with distance, for example. Um, so in the next slide, um, we'll start, actually with the canvas, with the room engine. So, so again, this is the idea here. It's not like um, uh, a reverb as an effect, but reverb as creating a space, a common space for the different sound objects to, uh, to be placed. Um, because here we are talking about um, particularly the live application frontal system. Um, it's also important, very important that we have the, we had the right controls to actually um, complement the natural acoustics of the venue. So this is that was part of the requirement when we designed this uh, this room engine. It also had to um, to also be able to adapt seamlessly between some 2D layouts typically or in 3D or surround. So be also very agile in the way it will adapt. So, the, the, which led to a number of innovation on the on the room engine side, um, and and uh, finally, we, it gave us 
it gave us also the opportunity, this new approach of a fully 3D reverb, to actually also um, control the way the reverb is, you know, um, is uh, managed over the space in a very interesting new way, which what we call this pan following gain and delay shaper. So the, and the reverb is actually reacti reacting to where the sound, uh, the object are placed in space. And last but not least, it's about um, what we call here the precedent safeguard, um, which is about um, making sure that um, the, the late and early are balanced and delayed properly to make sure that you always hear the, the direct sound first, which can be quite a headache to manage manually in a, in a, in a, in a large venue. So this is a, just a very short introduction for the room engine. Um, now, if we move to the to the special processing uh, of the direct sound um, that we have mentioned a little bit. So, so I will go through a, a few of the kind of main main let's say uh, reasoning behind what we wanted to achieve with this sp special processing. So first was, uh, as was mentioned a, a bit earlier, it's about the localization accuracy. Uh, to, to really be able to benefit to the maximum localization accuracy that you can we can achieve, uh, meaning uh, really coming in the sound coming from one uh, one stack precisely. So being able to position them very uh, the object in space very precisely. Um, so that was the first one, the, this localization accuracy. Um, also important one was about uh, having a stable frequency response. Um, over the over the audience, whether the objects are static or dynamic or f even fast moving, and that led to a number of um, choices and uh, also uh, adaptation to the the typical algorithm that could be that could be used for such application. Um, the other element also when we were looking at all the different alternatives in terms of algorithm was we wanted to allow the, the, the mixing engineer, the, the creator of content to when he wants to, to actually um, get the, the, the intimacy, the, the, the proximity really to the max, to the max to, to one uh, line source can, uh, famous uh, acoustic sense, line source can achieve and which which means indeed uh, having the really the, the 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 sound coming precisely only in some cases from the from the line sources, so that was one of the choices, um, and so therefore uh, and it's also um, it was a natural also a natural requirement was that whatever we choose needs to scale very well, uh, whether you <coughs> uh, whether you are we are talking about a five. Uh, five array center center frontal system or uh, an arena of of any kind of size or including 3D um, that we that we will see not uh, not too much today but um, so this scalability was very important and we've seen it for the reverberation also the the, the engine that uh, ensured that precedence and it was of course the, the the same also for for the just the direct sound uh, uh, processing. Um, I think this um, the last bit I wanted to say here is that all the algorithm and the effort that was done in the algorithm to have uh, an, an even uh, high quality um, panning that that works very well requires really careful system design, and that was also a huge part of the effort at the, at the initial step of Elisa is actually what it, what makes um, a, a system design that works well together with such special processing. It really goes hand in hand. So yeah. OK. Thank so, you, Frederick. So I will uh, take over on that part. Uh, so uh, we have specific rules for ELISA frontal system design uh, that are actually the, the basis of all that we do and all that we'll be, we'll be discussing today is to say that uh, the system uh, that we're deploying in ELISA is decomposed into several components. Uh, the first one being what we call the scene system, which is typically the system that will take over whatever happens on stage. So all the action that's happening on stage will be uh, basically uh, reproduced and uh, based on what this system is going to give. And there are important uh, components uh, to think about is that it's a minimum of five full range sources 
which are positioned typically above the stage and will all uh, get a different signal, a discrete signal. They have to be distributed over the full width of what we call the performing zone. That means where the action or the performers are located on stage. And one very, very important thing in this design criteria is that we should maximize the shared coverage area among the full range sources. And that's actually what determines what we call the spatialized zone in which we can really reproduce an accurate uh, spatial sensation. And what it means is that whatever type of processing we would use, and whatever position of object we would use when we follow those guidelines, we are sure that coverage is assured for any object position. So even if we would choose to put an object only on one loudspeaker, coverage will be assured in this spatialized area. If we choose to put it over several, it's also a bit the same thing. And we see that as becoming a bit, uh, let's say the norm uh, for this type of, of uh, formats, is that more and more you see that type of design uh, being used with ELISA, but maybe over also with other uh, techniques. Uh, in addition to that uh, scene configuration, we recommend the use of a central configuration of subwoofer. So one uh, single line or multiple lines uh, in the center uh, together to be as close as possible to the center uh, main full range source, which is the one that will often like have the most of the low frequency energy. And that guarantees like uh, a maximized efficiency of the subwoofer system. So that's the configuration that gives us the maximum efficiency in the distance and the best homogeneity of the low frequency uh, over the over the coverage. And this one is typically fed more with monodomics. The system itself can be complemented as well with an extension system that we will often see like uh, in, um, in different type of applications, which is there as an option to expand uh, the panorama. It's often located on either side of the scene and also receives uh, discrete signals. And it will uh, also, the constraints is also that it should have the same shared coverage area as the scene system, which defines once again the spatialized zone. So it has the same constraints, it has the same design guidelines, and it works all together with the scene system. In order to uh, have all of this, you know, as uh, as metrics that are easy uh, to design and to design such a system for large audiences, we have implemented a number of metrics in SoundVision. If you have looked at uh, previous webinars uh, on ELISA and especially loudspeaker system design for ELISA, you should be familiar with those. But if you didn't, like it's probably a good opportunity to recap a bit on that. So we have, let's say, typical uh, metrics uh, that we are not detailing now, which will be related to the SPL capability of the system, the max average, the distribution, which is all about like uh, how homogeneous your SPL distribution will be. And that's uh, actually something that we can mostly uh, adjust with uh, proper design of individual line sources. And then a criteria of time, which is there to define a bit the alignment of the scene system in particular with uh, other components of the system. And then some which are more related to, uh, let's say, the, the, the spatial part of the effect. Uh, the first one being the spatial resolution. So the spatial resolution is quite simply the number of full range sources of a frontal system. And that's typically what will help us to increase the natural separation of sound objects. These are the number of kind of anchors on which we can place uh, sound objects on which we want to have the maximum precision. And this is what will help also to bring the natural separation of sound objects further. And that's something we'll see a bit later in the presentation. Another criteria, criterion is the one about the vertical localization error. And we uh, have made this choice of uh, detailing like what part of the audience will actually perceive the sounds with no more than 30 degrees of vertical uh, 
offset between uh, the performers on stage and what they can and uh, how they can be heard from the loudspeaker system and it's uh, given in a percentage of the audience in the shared uh, coverage area the spatialized area and that determines also the ability to achieve audiovisual fusion so audiovisual consistency in the vertical dimension and that's something again we'll detail a bit later and uh, and that helps at providing a consistent spatial impression, especially when we scale uh, that type of system. The horizontal localization uh, is a, a bit similar criteria that will try to guarantee that uh, between any real and amplified source, we have less than 7.5 uh, degrees of errors. Uh, of error, and uh, it's also given in percentage of the audience, and that gives us the ability to achieve audiovisual fusion or consistency in the horizontal dimension and again guarantee a consistent spatial impression for the audience and then we'll turn into so once we have established a little bit those design guidelines because they are the foundation of what we do uh, later on in terms of processing once all of that is guaranteed what are our options uh, for panning algorithms so there are two uh, algorithms, typical type of algorithms we could use for the type of application. The first one is what we could call like an amplitude based algorithm. And that's a little bit of a pragmatic approach to say if I have like a source in the middle of uh, typically three loudspeakers, I'm going to use those three loudspeakers and give them different gains in order to reproduce that intermediate position. And that's typically uh, one of these technique, known technique is called vector based amplitude panning. And there are several variants and uh, that have been developed uh, over the over the years. So we will try to drive the loudspeaker closest to the direction of the source. There are other approaches uh, uh, that are more like delay based and often they are more like, a, let's say, physically inspired approaches. Uh, the one uh, being the most well-known one being Wayfield synthesis and which actually uh, derives from physical principle that require an infinite uh, number of loudspeakers to start with and they are based on many different approximations that we will explain a little bit uh, in the next slides to uh, give you a little bit an idea of how this technique uh, can be derived. So uh, actually, the and the, the big question is with this kind of techniques, what can we really do on a typical five plus frontal loudspeaker system when we don't have an infinity, but we have only five or a little bit more than five? Uh, what can we do? What level of precision can we achieve? And how those two approaches compare, which will be a little bit the, what we want to focus on uh, during this webinar. So if we look at Wayfield synthesis as a technique, it's actually based on a, an old principle of physics from the 17th century, where you would say that if you have a source, so in that case, like uh, we use that Litzinger, uh, it actually emits like concentric waves within the space. And we could describe pretty much each of these waves as an ensemble of secondary sources that would reproduce exactly the same sound field further down the road. Once again, it's only based uh, uh, on the fact that we can have an infinite number of loudspeakers that we position in that case accurately along uh, the wave field that's generated by this singer. Obviously, that's not easily practical because that means if that singer would move, we would have to move the physical loudspeakers with him and that's uh, he or she and that's not very easy. And therefore, like uh, there's been some further mathematical formulations uh, from the kirchhoff helmholtz integral more in the 19th century that solved a bit that problem to say on a given distribution of uh, loudspeakers so a given surface uh, basically of loudspeakers we are capable actually of reproducing multiple source positions by actually driving the loudspeakers a bit differently but still to be able to derive uh, an actual feasible uh, technique, you need to do quite a lot of approximations. Like the theory 
still requires an infinite number of loudspeakers. And that derivation, those approximations of what wave field synthesis is all about, is that we use, uh, in the end, a finite number of regularly spaced loudspeakers that are fed using like uh, the, the original source of the uh, sound of the object, uh, using delays at first, gains and filtering. Uh, and that's in the idea that you could create something like an acoustical window. And the idea for the delays is actually quite simple, is that what you would typically do is that you would uh, realign each speaker towards the position of a source. So that means you would have larger delays for speakers that are further uh, away from the given source. So for example, in the case of that singer. So typically, that means that anytime you have a new position, you have to realign the entire system towards the intended position, the intended location of that source. So that all works nicely, uh, let's say in theory. The thing is that to be able to derive that technique to a feasible, let's say a reasonable uh, amount of speaker, you have to do a lot of approximations, as I said. So you start with a continuous 3D closed distribution of ideal loudspeakers, an infinite number of loudspeakers, and you end up with only five of them above the stage. So there's definitely a gap between the two. So you start, the, the first simplification is that instead of having like this 3D closed surface around all of your sources or around your listening space, which is definitely not feasible in practice, uh, you would use only a line of loudspeakers above the stage. And the problem with that is that it will straight away introduce incorrect vertical localization. So as with any of this type of reproduction, when you have loudspeakers above the stage and the performers are on stage, there is a mismatch in localization and potentially a time alignment issue with acoustical sources on stage, because as speakers and performers are not at the same height, depending where the audience is, there might be a time mismatch uh, between the two and the vertical localization, the vertical mismatch will also get slightly different. The second important simplification is that instead of having that nice line uh, of loudspeakers, uh, which is kind of continuous, you're going to have only a finite number of loudspeakers. And if we look at what it does, so here I'm showing like this figure where we have like a frequency response uh, over like uh, a few, let's say, uh, microphones along a given line. And we are looking uh, for actually quite a lot of loudspeakers because in that case, we would have about like 15 cent centimeter spacing. So that means like basically on a typical stage, we would need like uh, 140 speakers to be able to reproduce that. And we see that already like above a certain frequency, we see quite a lot of interference patterns. And that frequency basically reduces when you re reduce the amount of loudspeakers you're going to use. And for a typical four meter loudspeaker spacing that we would have on a 16 meter wide stage, this frequency goes down to 100 Hertz. So that means there is not much uh, completely clean um, energy or waveform that you can reconstruct in reality. So what happened above the so what happens above the aliasing frequency? Once again, as we said, the loudspeakers are time aligned against the position of the object. So what it means is that all frontal loudspeakers are used with different gains. Uh, sorry, with uh, yeah, so we are time aligned against the position of the object. So we use delays to start with. And in terms of gains, so we use all speakers and also and the, the gains get more and more similar as a source would move upstage. So the more the source moves upstage, the more in uh, in amplitude the speakers are being used. So we use more and more speakers and we'll see that that has consequences. And uh, therefore, like you don't have any longer a very clean uh, wavefront as what we could see when we have a large number of loudspeakers, but more individual speaker contributions. 
and the positioning so how we perceive uh, that type of localization that type of uh, sound sources is that it will be hardly driven by the first wave the first sound that we receive from one of the loudspeakers so in the end like we are pretty close to other uh, techniques that are delay based over known techniques like delta stereophony or the like Okay, and what we have is an interference sound field where all the speakers con uh, contribute together, uh, which will induce like a bit of a blurred localization, so not as precise uh, as we want it to be, and uh, some level of coloration for any object position. So from the original promise, we see that uh, there are quite some uh, things that are not quite there any longer because of the low number of loudspeakers that we can allow ourselves to use. Okay, and now I will uh, let the word to Frédéric to uh, go into, uh, let's say, the algorithms that are used in ELISA and the design goals. Um, thank you. Yeah, so in contrast to what, uh, what Etienne just has presented, um, we look a bit at, uh, at the goals and the choices that we've made uh, for the, the main uh, panning algorithm. So, uh, first of all, we wanted to retain the maximum sound quality, inherent sound quality that we can extract from, uh, from both the content and uh, the, the, the line arrays, the, the, the reproducing loudspeakers that we have. So, that was the first, of course, obvious for us, obvious goal. Um, then we wanted to keep, to make things simple and retain as much as possible um, backward compa compatibility, at least um, have. Um, something that is very uh, familiar for people in terms of panning. So some, some kind of uh, uh, way of panning the sound that was quite familiar for, for people. Um, then uh, again, to also part of that kind of making things simple, it's about having a panning that sounds uh, even wherever you go. You can pan and the timber, the, the, the balance uh, will also uh, sound equal. So there, is, there, there should not be a worry about managing depending on where your source is uh, how how your sound will where your source will sound actually so that was a bit the high level um, goals that we uh, that we had and um, and and finally um, it had to be able to scale uh, to any kind of layout like i said before and that includes all kinds of uh, of the most interesting uh, three layouts uh, like we've done so those were the goals and now I'll, I'll look a bit more about the, the details. Um, the, Etienne was pre presenting uh, briefly the, the, the VBAP, the vector-based amplitude panning, and uh, so this is typically what is used um, for, to, to pan the sound between two or three loudspeakers, and uh, so it's quite pragmatic, but at the same time does retain the maximum sound quality um, that, uh, that you can achieve. And we can extend it with the multiple direction uh, amplitude panning, MDAP, which is just an extension basically of the VBAP um, that can be used to, to, to spread uh, over a wider, let's say, area on the, the sound, which can be, can be done, but with very, very, uh, very much some care and some, uh, some additional um, thoughts and, and uh, processing. So, um, because we wanted to have that kind of sound quality that is even uh, in terms of uh, wherever you are panning, um, and that means we we needed to look into what how how the panning would sound differently, and and the fact is um, the the low frequencies and the high frequencies don't add up in the same way. Are not in the end won't be add, are not perceived in the same way. Uh, especially when your source is placed um, between two loudspeakers. So when your source is on a single loudspeaker, it's snapped. It's perfect. The, the optimal, uh, full, uh, full, um, very nicely balanced um, uh, sound from the speaker is achieved. But as you are panning, you have the fact that the, the way the several speakers will contribute to the, the sound you perceived will be perceived differently depending on low or high frequencies. In the low frequencies, mostly amplitude uh, um, ad addition basically between the different sources, whereas for the high frequency, it's more an energy uh, addition. And therefore, you have that balance that if you don't, if you're not careful, does change between 
um, between when you are on a stack or you are in between stacks. And that's true for 2D and that's true for 3D. So that had to some consequences of, uh, on our side to uh, to compensate for that, so that you don't have to take um, you have, don't have to take care of it basically, and naturally it will sound uh, evenly balanced between the the low the low the low mids and the, and the higher frequencies. Um, so that's for the pan dependent frequency compensation. Um, the other element where uh, we we added our own. Um, uh, our own thinking, let's say, is on the width control. Um, so that's basically when you want to have more than uh, to to enhance, let's say, the width or the perceived the perceive width, basically, of your of your object. So I think the the next uh, slide is uh, goes a bit more into the details. So how does it work? At least yeah, let's look in, into the the case of two D. Um, so um, this perception of width, and you may have uh, different goals behind it, but uh, often it's about um, making your sound, uh, your object, make it sound less pinpointing. And we have the full gradual approach here. You can go from the, the maximally uh, pinpointing, which would be, uh, you know, you would be on a speaker exactly, to something that would be spread over a number of, uh, a number of typically a number of, of speakers. Uh, and we had again the, this kind of um, goals when we started to design the widths. And one of them was it had to be um, very, um, very much um, minimal impact on coloration. And that's always quite, quite a challenge when you're talking about uh, widths. If you don't, if we just spread the sound, of course, on the number of speakers, you quickly get into really nasty, actually, coloration. You are just playing the same signal on many speakers. You uh, immediately create some interference patterns, some comb filtering, and it sounds really bad and not very stable across an audience. So you look at ways to uh, to counter that. And there are different, oh, lots of different options. What we, what was very important for us um, was to retain the temporal aspect of the sound so that even if you're if you're using like per percussive sound uh, to some extent the, the voice also can be um, impacted uh, it's the width won't be uh, won't be something that will deteriorate the, the this temporal aspect um, and overall the the timber will be as much as possible respected so that you can you can play with it you can Manage a bit that um, that uh, you know this how wide uh, this this uh, source will be, um, being uh, being confident the it, it won't it won't damage your the the sound quality. So this can be used here for you know again there are many different applications and people to try and see a bit what works for them, but it's definitely useful when you are trying to spread uh, sound like here there's a C wave, but it could be some kind of kind of synthesizers or it could be just when you want something to be just uh, very smooth, also uh, smooth panning for, for example, that where it will very slowly and evenly. Um, um, spread around, along all the different speakers as you are moving uh, a source. So there's a lot of applications. Um, this is uh, uh, so this this was uh, I think one of the interesting and uh, interestingly developed uh, algorithm for this uh, for this width. Um, I think that's uh, uh, next. Um, we yeah. have, I think, yeah, it's going to be back to you, uh, Etienne, about now looking at all those algorithms in the context of the evaluation. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Uh, okay, so now we we'll look a little bit about how can we uh, actually objectively uh, compare these algorithms on the same, uh, in the same situation. So what we did actually is to take like let's say a reference situation, which is uh, typically what we could experience in a, in a live situation at different scales. So uh, looking into stage sizes of 10, 16 and 20 meters of width uh, with a 10 meter deep stage, always 10 meter deep because that's as deep as we would want to go. We consider the loudspeaker system, which would be always uh, the same in the in the sense that we always use only five loudspeakers, which are spanning the full width of the stage. 
So it will have slightly different spacing, but overall they uh, it's the same speaker count. And uh, independently of the width of the stage, they are six meters uh, above the stage. We consider two different object positions. So one central stage, which will be basically in line with the center uh, loudspeaker and a house right uh, uh, object that will be basically exactly in between the fourth and the fifth loudspeaker so that we can also test for something a bit interference also from the uh, from the panning itself uh, and we test for positions of one two five and ten meter in depth uh, on the stage so the further we go up stage the higher the number basically and we look for audiences area so for each state size we would have a slightly different audience area so that's 10 by uh, 12 by 12 meter for the 12 meter wide stage uh, 16 by 16 and 20 by 20 for the different uh, stage sizes and we count one listener every two meter so this was done pre uh, actually uh, social distancing but uh, Unfortunately, these days it could end up being realistic. Uh, so um, that's in order to be able to do uh, that kind of thing, uh, instead of doing a true uh, localization test, which would be quite difficult to, under, to organize, considering the very high number of uh, positions that we want to test, of algorithms, of uh, uh, positions in terms of audience, in terms of object, uh, we have used actually what's called uh, auditory modeling techniques. So instead of directly using like a, a real brain, we use some kind of virtual brain uh, that help us to mimic uh, uh, the way we are perceiving sound uh, in nature. So actually, uh, this is something that has evolved quite dramatically in the last like 10 years. Uh, before that, like uh, it was quite hard to find like models that were close enough to uh, what you could experience in uh, perceptual experiments. But uh, actually for two type of things, like uh, uh, we use this auditory modeling toolbox, which is providing very accurate algorithm that have been tested against some real perceptual experiments with humans that were basically uh, cre uh, telling where they would perceive sound and the results would be compared with the outcome of the model. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, the, the results are really, really accurate. So that was a good, uh, good way for us to do that type of testing and multiply the number of use cases uh, to, to test about that. So we look into localization which is uh, what we call the perceived spatial origin of a sound so as a human it's basically uh, where you think the sound is actually coming from and often from this type of model you have two uh, feedback one which is called the accuracy so that's basically when you take like all participants all the people who are participating into such a perceptual experiment, it's their average response. So all of them agreed on average that the source, the sound they have perceived is there. It tells us something, but actually not everything, because one very important uh, notion as well is what could be called blur. It's this uncertainty in localization which will basically correspond to the spread of the participant sensors. So if we had many participants, let's say 10 or 15, which is often the case, and ask them like three, five times about uh, where do you perceive the sound, it will be basically among those 45 maybe answers you will collect, how these responses are distributed. So how different that can they be? And uh, another thing we've been testing is what's called spatial unmasking. And it's the unmasking benefit we get from spatially uh, separating the sounds. It's one benefit that's really important to uh, spatial audio actually, and uh, especially in our live application, is that by moving out the sources among each other, we have uh, the possibility to unmask, to limit the natural masking that they would have if they would be coming from the exact same position. What it means is that we can use typically far less EQ and far less 
compression to be able for each of the sound of a, of a complex mix to exist on its own and to be heard properly. Especially when they share about like the same kind of frequency range or they play a little bit like in unison or something like that. It's often hard to perceive different sounds or it's quite a hard job for the sound engineer to make that happen. And actually by spreading them in space, we have a good possibility of improving that. So let's look at localization first. So what we said previously is that by design or our goal, what we want to achieve is that we want to minimize the localization mismatch uh, in typically two dimensions. That means in the vertical domain where we want to have below 30 degrees and that will be primarily because of loudspeaker positioning. So these are practical constraints. How high or how low basically can we put the loudspeaker setup to make sure that we can uh, have that happening for the maximum part of the audience. The other one is in the horizontal dimension uh, where we want the sounds to be not so much like away from the intended position, especially when we want to have this audiovisual consistency, when we want the auditory and the visual aspects to work together properly. And that limit is typically 7.5 degrees and that will depend on the loudspeaker system layout and also on the panning algorithm that we're going to use. And the question is why is this enough? So why 30 degrees and 7.5 degrees? It's actually because typically in horizontal localization, when you compare what the auditory uh, precision of the brain, so what the brain can distinguish at best, in the auditory domain, we say about one to three degrees typically, and the visual uh, domain will be one arc minute. So it's one sixtieth of a degree at best, especially in front. So that means typically the brain will more easily trust uh, what the visual says than what the audio says. And until something like 7.5 degrees of mismatch, the brain will automatically associate uh, the positions to make, uh, to say like, I trust what I see more than what I hear. And, I, and that, will, that is the position that I'm going to decide on. In the vertical domain, it's actually uh, even larger what we can do because the auditory precision is often in the range of 10 to 20 degrees. We are not really good at localizing in the vertical domain. And that's basically because our ears are in this horizontal dimension and we would need some kind of a third ear above our head or somewhere else to be able to better distinguish uh, what comes from top or bottom or in front of us. So that's why we can allow ourselves a larger window in the vertical because the brain will be more forgiving uh, if we don't do like the exact height uh, as we wanted it to be. In order to ensure the audiovisual consistency, there is one specific topic uh, which will be the depth of the object on stage. So what we have to see is that for two objects, so in that case, like, uh, oh, sorry, if we look at these two objects on stage, like the singer would have moved like uh, just uh, downstage, like house right, and the, uh, the guitar would have moved back. What we can see as for this one guy, like who is in the middle of the audience, although like the two are along the same width of the stage, they would be perceived at different locations at a different angle in the horizontal dimension. For this one guy who is in front here, like it doesn't change, like uh, both of them are in the same direction. So that means like possibly we may want uh, to be able to reproduce that effect from uh, the sound reproduction itself. And typically in amplitude based algorithms for the panning itself, we usually don't account for that dimension. So the question is, when we talk about five loudspeakers, uh, do we have an ability with delay-based algorithms to be more accurate than what uh, amplitude-based algorithm can do? And that's what we're going to look into. So in order to do that, what we did is this virtual experiment uh, where we would calculate the error 
as a difference between uh, the target localization, so what we expect uh, people to hear, so the target diamond direction of uh, the performer of stage or of the pan that we have decided for on the console, uh, and what participants, all participants would respond. Because basically when we have the feedback uh, from the model, but also from any perceptual experiment, we would get like, as I said, the accuracy, but also the blur. Because the answers of the participants are not going to be all the same. So that means like uh, we have to look into all these responses of the participants to be really able to distinguish about like the quality and the error uh, against what we want to achieve. And that we want to do for all participants positions in the audience. We don't want to favor one position against the other. So that's what we have done and uh, that's how we can actually compare what we wanted to achieve and what we can really achieve uh, with uh, such uh, a loudspeaker setup. So if we look typically for an off axis object on stage, so we have this 16 meter wide stage and we have this guitarist basically which is uh, typically located in between the two uh, outer uh, li uh, line sources and we test for different depth of the guitarist on stage. What we see is that the localization error we recover between amplitude based in black and delay based in blue is actually almost similar. So if we look at different depth on stage at one meter or two meter, it's identical and the error is fairly low. We've put that uh, line here at 7.5 degree, which is our limit. And if we go a little bit further back on stage, upstage, we see that the error gets higher for both algorithms. So the delay base is not fully resolving uh, this uh, slight mismatch that when we have when the source moves upstage and the distribution, so how the, the responses are spread uh, between the different participants and that's the length of this line is quite high. It's a bit lower for the delay based algorithm, but it's still quite high uh, for, for the large distance and overall we are not actually much better. And that is actually true for different stage widths. So if we look into 12 meters and now 20 meters, we see that we have exactly the same trend and uh, even at 20 meters, it's really not much better. So we see that overall we are still okay. We're still okay, but for both algorithm in the same way, we are not better with one or another. Okay, and now if we look on axis, so instead of using that off axis position, this outright position, we use the center position, for example, for the singer to be either like up stage, uh, down stage, sorry, or up stage almost completely at the back there. What we see is that up stage, we're really good and we're still okay backstage, uh, sorry, up stage. And uh, that's, uh, that trend is actually the same uh, for different stage widths uh, as we had for the off axis position. So overall, what we can say is that uh, amplitude based and delay based algorithm have a similar localization performance. There is not one clear winner over the other when we have five loudspeakers above the stage. And we have to remember that these five loudspeakers is some kind of, let's say the norm these days, because it's a feasible, it's already uh, a step uh, from the two or the maximum three that we have in LCR. It's, a, it's an agreeable st a step that people are willing to go for. And, uh, and also there's the visual impact about having more loudspeakers. So it's quite a good trade-off. We still have a line length also uh, that enables us to be able to have a good distribution of energy over the audience, which is still very important even for, uh, for this kind of spatial audio. So we, we can't have much more than these five loudspeakers in most cases. 
can I add a comment, Etienne, on that stage? Uh, yeah, sure. It's yeah, also yeah. a practical choice to have five speakers because uh, uh, we've seen on your graphs that most of the results were below the red line, right? Yeah. Below, below the acceptable uh, uh, error. So, so it's a pragmatic choice. You're, you're it's a right pragmatic choice, that. exactly. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and uh, and we saw that it's true for various stage and audience sizes. OK. So why is that? Why don't we get better? Uh, what we thought could be better with uh, delay based algorithm. And the problem is that when uh, uh, actually uh, what what makes it not better is that with only five loudspeakers or with five loudspeakers, uh, we see that the blur, the blur, the localization blur, so the distribution of participant sensor, meaning like the source being less easy to localize at a precise position, largely increases as performers move upstage for delay-based algorithm. And the reason why is that uh, we're using more and more of the speakers, the gains are getting higher and higher, and the theoretical benefits that we had are not there in practice when we talk uh, about these five loudspeakers. Okay, another topic is the one of time alignment. Uh, so the motivation is that we want to make sure that uh, what comes from the loudspeaker system and what comes from the stage, so the acoustical contribution, the acoustical sources we have on stage, are actually uh, bringing um, sound in about the same time uh, area. So that's actually quite important for a number of applications like musicals, uh, Broadway shows, and, or septal reinforcement where we have actors on stage, maybe theater, and we want just to have a bit of voice lifting and we want to make sure the natural, the original voice is properly time aligned and not creating artifacts with what comes from the loudspeaker system. And there's actually a classical time limit that we can apply, which is in the range of five milliseconds. We know that if we have only five milliseconds difference between the original, so the acoustical source and the amplified source, we should be good to go. And that's typically what we would use also, you know, in terms of alignment of field system against uh, a main system. And uh, the potential mismatch that we get, that we could get, would be uh, because of the incorrect theoretical depth positioning, which uh, could be like something to be, uh, uh, so to say, blamed on amplitude-based systems. But also, and that's very important, like the fact that the speakers are flown and the performers are on stage. So as we said earlier for WFS, but that's true for any type of uh, basically panning technique on this type of loudspeaker system, there will be that mismatch and there's this potential for misalignment. So if we look into it now for different type of uh, stage widths, what we see is that we also can achieve very similar performance for amplitude based or delay based technique. So we have the ability to get below this five millisecond limit for all the positions in the audience. And we have to remember that the positions that are the most sensitive to that are probably are probably close to the stage. And that's exactly those positions we've been testing. So these 12 by 12 and 16 by 16 or 20 by 20 audience area, uh, something I forgot to mention, starts at four meters for the stage. So we're really testing for positions pretty close, which can be quite sensitive for all these phenomena, phenomena that we're looking into. So, uh, if we look at 12 meter wide stage, it's the same. 20 meter wide, we have the same. We look at on axis, 16 meter wide stage, we're good. 12 meter wide stage, we're good. And 20 meter wide stage, we're good. So we can see that we can achieve good time alignment for both amplitude based and delay based algorithms. And this is pretty much independent of stage width or object position. So now let's look into uh, the third dimension that we wanted to test for, and that's uh, spatial and masking. As I said, that's something that's really, really important because that's the potential to reduce masking of concurrent sounds by increasing the spatial separation. So that's the usual 
uh, let's say, fight in a mix to be able to be uh, that all sounds can be heard uh, properly and will not like compete against each other. And the way it works uh, for, uh, for the auditory system is that it has two main components. The first one is what we could call edge shadowing. So that means like if we have two sounds like the singer and the guitarist that are playing at about the same level, because of the fact that the air is a bit of a, of a mask itself, it's, a, it's blocking a bit of sound, like there will be typically more high frequencies on this ear than on this one, because this one like has to go a little bit around the to reach the ear and the high frequencies will be much lower. So that means that if, uh, and that's sometimes called better ear effect, so that means the brain will focus more on that one here, that is on the left side, so opposite to a guitar player, where the guitar player is a bit lower in level, especially in high frequencies, against the lead singer and will help to better distinguish uh, the guitar, uh, the lead singer against the, the guitar. Uh, it could use also at lower frequencies some time difference at low frequencies. So uh, that means that at lower frequencies, the sound of the guitar will arrive earlier at the right ear than at the left ear. And that's something the brain uses to be able to better distinguish in instruments or sounds in general. So, in order for that to work, uh, actually, the more precise in localization you are, the better it is, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. So, if we look at what we have and uh, we look into that situation where we have our lead singer here in the center and the guitar here at different depth, so they could be both like uh, downstage or they could be both upstage. And what we see is that as this depth along the stage increases, the amplitude based uh, algorithm remains very similar in its uh, ability to unmask the source. So we have about of a 6 dB advantage we have maintained from the fact that the source and the, both sources are not collocated. 6 dB, that means like it's 6 dB on a fader or it's uh, that same amount in EQ uh, that you don't have to do. And that's quite considerable. And uh, when you look into what the delay based algorithm is doing, so it's doing quite an equivalent job when sources are fairly close to a stage because the speakers are not used to a very high level. But when the sources moves upstage, this advantage is actually quite decreasing. And we end so, up by about half of what we had originally. So Etienne, if I understand correctly, uh, in this graph, we should read that uh, the higher number, the better performance. On the of contrary course. of the previous yeah, graph, yeah. where the lower the number, the better the performance. So here, yeah. if we have a bigger uh, unmasking in dB, it means that we have a better ability to separate the, um, the objects. Yeah, exactly. And we won't have to push as much the fader. We won't have to, uh, con uh, you know, uh, put as much compression so that we avoid that this source will, you know, like uh, start to mask uh, the lead instrument. So that's quite a big benefit that we can get there. OK, and again, like what we can do is to look into uh, a similar situation, but for different stage widths and uh, for different uh, audience area size. And we see that this halving uh, of uh, the delay based algorithm is kind of confirmed. So we have always about the same kind of effect. OK, and same here for a 20 meter wide stage. So it's actually quite independent of the of the size of the installation. OK, why do we have that? Uh, so one, uh, the reason actually is because of this localization blur. The fact that this second element, like the guitar that we have here, is not as well localized as uh, when it moves upstage. So it's getting bigger and bigger in width, but it's a width that we can't control. It's something that's uh, given uh, by the algorithm. 
and uh, actually it's reducing especially the low frequency components of the spatial unmasking so that uh, time information is not clear enough that we can benefit from it and that we can find back in the localization blur estimate that we get is that for this guitar which is typically in between the fourth and the fifth so on the house right part of the stage um, it's spanned over there and the blur that we get in localization is increasing quite a lot uh, uh, for the delay based algorithm where it remains constant basically for the amplitude based okay and one way to still get like a, uh, like a more accurate localization and a very reduced blur is actually to decide not to pan uh, in between speaker and that's something that you can choose uh, objectively in Elisa but to say no I want the maximum precision so I can snap uh, that sound to be on only one uh, of the loudspeaker and maximize uh, the, the localization precision so that's something that we see here for example if we look at that localization blur figure for this on axis uh, uh, sound object which is basically this lead vocal this lead singer we see that the localization blur gets reduced quite a lot that's also true uh, for the delay based algorithm but only when you get very close so in the end they are quite similar but when the source moves upstage very quickly the localization blur will increase and we lose uh, that precision uh, that we want to have so uh, in the end, what we get there is that we can enforce to have a single physical source with a coherent wavefront that's being generated, which is basically what a line source is all about. And we can maximize that projection effect and localization accuracy. So what it will do, and that's also another side effect, and I think that's something we can stay with for the end, is to bring, uh, we all know, like this advantage of line sources that especially um, it's a it's a known signature effect of l-acoustics line sources is that they can bring the sound closer to you and that's a way also to make sure that the sound is closer than the stage it feels very close it feels very intimate and that's definitely because you have chosen to put it only on one of these line sources and when you blur that, when you use more than one speaker, this is going to get a little bit further away. It's going to be closer to a stage. So it's a way also to have some sounds really popping out and coming at you in a very consistent way for the entire audience. And that's probably the only way, the only accurate way to do that. OK, so uh, I think we we've reached the end of this presentation and I want to thank you for your attention. If there are any more questions, I think we'll all be happy to answer them. Etienne, uh, thank you. Uh, Guillaume, thank you very much. And Frederick, thank you very much. That was um, really quite interesting. I, I think all of us have in our minds you know, the ability to use uh, delay to shift the position of something. And what you're really discussing here is, is wave field synthesis is a, a very complex way to use delay to, to make people perceive things in a, a specific location. Um, that was that was really good to understand how that that differs from say the Elisa approach, which is, is, is not multiplying that signal over multiple rays. Um, so thank you for that. Um, there was a couple of questions coming in. Um, uh, 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 but I think the, the moderators did a great job of answering most of them. There was one at the end here, someone was just asking, and, and Etienne, maybe you can dig into this just a little bit more, re-explain it one more time to make sure everyone is clear on it, because um, it, it sounds like uh, someone is asking, can we use amplitude and delay? And that sounds a lot like what WFS does on its own anyways, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So WFS would use uh, that. Actually, it would use uh, gains, uh, but the all, let's say, the all benefit or the all uh, add-on of this approach is to use the delays. If you use the gains without the delays, you've lost because it's all uh, those gains are there to make the delays work better in a way, because the gains you can think of it as being mostly you know like the fact that when the uh, to make sure that all the speakers are driven properly that they 
accurately together reproduce like what was intended originally, which is reproduce that position, and that's with the delays. So if you use the gains without the delays, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, they have to be together to make it work. Well, thank you, Etienne, on that. And I have a question. I think that Frederick, uh, this is like right up your alley. Um, some sure. there was a couple people asking a little bit about you. You mentioned the reverb engine. Um, and specifically the the, the precedence uh, guarantee that it has. Um, do you want to just maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Maybe this is uh, something we'll have to develop into a bigger topic in the future. Yeah, yeah definitely. If there's uh, a lot of questions on it. Yeah, to, just to, to sum up a bit, yeah, the, the question and 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 the answer. It was about indeed how uh, how the the um, the Eliza reverb uh, engine. Um, is actually managing to make sure that the direct sound uh, arrives at um, at any place in the audience before the, the late reverberation. And um, but I think what was maybe not 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 very clear at um, at uh, at first was that the, the, this uh, 3D reverberation is reproduced by the whole uh, system, and therefore. That it doesn't mean that uh, what you will hear will, will come necessarily very late if you are, for example, more towards the front of the audience, because all of it, all this energy field is diffused uh, everywhere in the audience. So I hope it clarifies a little bit. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I, I, I guess ahead, we yeah. could um, um, we could say that uh, we'll try to develop more webinars on specific parts of the, the 3D layout. So. Hopefully in the future we could talk a bit more about 3D use cases and surround use cases, yes. which are very interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think today uh, we had uh, already a fairly large topic on on just the, the 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 frontal system alone, but we could elaborate on this a lot more. So I really want to thank uh, Etienne. I want to thank uh, Frederick and Guillaume, and of course uh, Sergey Martin and uh, and Frederick too. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us uh, today. Um, please don't hesitate to uh, post any questions below if you're watching this on YouTube. Don't hesitate to reach out to, to us on social media. If you are on YouTube and watching this right now, don't forget that subscribe button right below. That way you'll know that uh, we've got more content coming out on a regular basis. Um, thank you guys very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you uh, to our three uh, presenters and Etienne. Uh, thank you for helping to uh, uh, organize and corral all of us together. Uh, if you haven't already, you can download the paper on the Acoustics website. The link is below in the YouTube and the link is in the Q&A if you're watching live. Um, everyone, please have a great rest of your day and we will talk to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye-bye.